I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker for the day. It's Professor Christine Bigby, who is the Director of Living with Disability Research Centre at La Trobe University. Chris has a national and international reputation for her research in the social inclusion of adults with intellectual disability. I've heard her speak a number of times and she's fantastic. Uh, the focus of her work is policy issues, program effectiveness and frontline practice that supports quality of life outcomes for people with intellectual disability. She's currently examining the effectiveness of supported accommodation services, the nature and meaning of social inclusion for people with intellectual disability and supported decision making for people with cognitive disability. Christine's keynote will focus on what the evidence says about housing and support for people with intellectual disability. Welcome Christine. I'm going to speak from, uh, from the research that I've been doing over the last 10 years around uh, what makes a difference uh, for people with intellectual disabilities in terms of housing and support. So I'm drawing on a lot of data um, from a study which has involved 14 organisations across five states in, in Australia um, and has looked at something like 500 um, group homes or supported living situations. But I'm not going to bore you with all of the methods that we've used. I'm just trying to let you know my credentials and that's what I'm talking from. Um, so it's not just a small study, it's a longitudinal study that we've been doing. So the important thing I think to start with is what we're all concerned about is the quality of life of people with intellectual disabilities or people with a disability. And quality of life has these sort of eight dimensions. And the important thing to remember though is that these are subjective. Some of these are subjective and some are objective. So what means what feels like home for me will be quite different for what feels like home for somebody else. It's a subjective sense of belonging and having a home. There aren't objective measures. And having a home, having a house isn't enough. You need the other things that go with it. You need a sense of, of being in control. You need social relationships. And what we know uh, from a lot of research is that having a good quality of life, you can't have that unless you're engaged. Unless you're engaged in social relationships with a range of other people and in activities that are meaningful and purposeful to you. So I think you, you need to sort of bear that bigger picture in mind when you're thinking about housing and support options. Housing and support, what makes the difference? These, these are some of the key things that make a difference in terms of quality of life outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities. There are necessary but not sufficient conditions that people need to have. They need to have a home, they need to have a house, and they need to have um, adequate resources. Once you've got a home and a house and adequate resources, you then need support in order to live a good life in that house. And it's the support that makes the difference. And there's a range of things that influence the quality of that support. And I'm going to try and unpack some of those for you. One of the things that we don't have hardly any evidence about in Australia, but we have evidence about from the UK, is that you need to have sufficient resources in terms of sufficient staff support that meets your needs. And what we know from some large work in the UK is that skilled support doesn't cost any more than poor support. Having, having unskilled staff costs as much as having skilled staff, and having more staff is not necessarily better. You don't get incremental benefits from having more staff. Sometimes you actually get decreasing benefits because the staff spend time talking to each other. So, in terms of necessary but not sufficient conditions, you need to have a house or a home or an apartment and you need to have it designed uh, in a way that most supports the quality of life and that's about the design and the size of it and we know from an enormous body of research about institutions and deinstitutionalization that small is better than large there's no doubt about it that large institutions cannot support a good quality of life and that the, and that you need to have a small number of people living together. No more than six. Doesn't mean you have to have six. One to six, no more. If you have more than six people, you get a drop in the quality of life. It's not an incremental drop, it's falling off a cliff. So nobody should be building or looking at houses that have more than six people in them. 
You need to have houses that are in ordinary streets, in ordinary communities, that are dispersed amongst those communities, rather than being clustered together. Having five or six houses on the same site is almost equivalent to living in an institution. So if you cluster houses together, you get poorer outcomes in terms of poor social inclusion, poor material well-being, poor self-determination, poorer personal development and poorer rights. There's, there's no question about that. What we don't know a lot about is the differences between um, supported living, uh, which I think Marita is going to talk some more about, which is where one or two people live on their own with drop-in support, have their own tenancy or actually own their own house. There's, a, there's some research around that. Um, but because that hasn't been an option uh, very widely in Australia, there's not a lot of research about it. The only option for many people for many years, certainly in, in Victoria um, and in New South Wales, has been uh, group homes. So we actually know quite a lot about group homes. We don't know much about supported living. There's a lot of assumptions made about supported living, but there's not a lot of evidence. There's some literature that suggests that if you live in a drop-in situation with a smaller number of people and have your own tenancy, that you have a greater sense of choice, um, that you use a wider range of community services and you go out more. And it's also significantly cheaper. But there's also some evidence that there's poorer outcomes in terms of likelihood to being exploited, in terms of having regular scheduled activities, um, in terms of health, uh, management um, and money management. We did a study um, uh, two or three years ago and compared uh, the quality of life for people who were living in our larger group home sample with a smaller sample of people who were living in drop-in support. And we found very few differences other than having people having a greater sense of choice and control. Objectively, we would say they didn't actually have greater choice and control because most didn't have control over the staff that were coming into their home. But they had a greater sense of control over their own space. But actually, the people that were living in group homes and the people that were living in supported housing actually had a pretty mediocre quality of life, both of which could have been significantly improved. So who lives? Who lives where? Most people that don't live at home with their families um, have traditionally lived in group homes because that's been the only option. Group homes at the moment have people that have an enormously wide range of abilities. They have people with very mild intellectual disabilities and people with much more severe intellectual disabilities. There is a significant overlap between the uh, adaptive behaviour, the sort of capacity of people that live in group homes and people that are living more independently in the community. There's about a 30% overlap. That suggests that there's enormous potential for many people that are living in group homes to live more independently and to think about, is there another option than a group home? And some people could actually move out or group homes could be reconfigured so that they're providing less support for people or they can be divided up into more independent units. And it's likely that that's going to change over time and that the level of support that people need, uh, people going into group homes or shared supported living, is going to increase significantly because the other people may not well be eligible. However, thinking about that, the design of the house is necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for a good life. What we know from uh, some of the early research that was done in the UK is that there's significant overlap, and I'm going to use engagement as a sort of indicator of quality of life. So the level of engagement of people that lived in large institutions and the level of engagement of people that lived in small institutions and in staffed housing in group homes overlapped. So their quality of life was actually quite variable in each of those uh, types of settings. And so you got the situation where the poorest group home was actually not as good as the better institutions. And the, the message from that early work is that the model of housing isn't sufficient on its own. It's the quality of support that's provided in that model of housing that makes the difference. And that's incredibly variable. 
Now that's early data from the UK. What I can share with you is the data from our Australian study, which also shows that there's significant variability in the quality of life outcomes measured by engagement over time between people that are living and being supported by the same organisation and between people that are living in different organisations and between people that are living in the same service. So if you look at this, um, each of the ones that are coloured the same indicate uh, the difference in the average level of engagement of the people that were living in services in that organisation um, about five or six years <coughs> apart. And you can see that those triangles are progressively, for each of those two sets of pairs of them, increased. So all the organisations in our study actually increased quite significantly the level of engagement of the people that they were supporting. So the quality of life of people went up because these organisations paid significant attention to the quality of support that they were providing. But nevertheless, it remained enormously variable. So these are houses, these are organisations that are similarly funded across Australia. And there's a range of engagement for people from nine minutes in every hour to 52 minutes in every hour. That's an enormous range, which shouldn't happen. People should be getting quality support and people should be having a relatively high level of engagement. Most of us are engaged for 99% of the time that we're awake. Most of us spend almost very, very little time sitting doing absolutely nothing. That's not the case for many people that live in group homes. And the support and the quality of outcomes for people who have more severe intellectual disabilities, who have higher support no needs, are consistently <coughs> poorer than for people with lower support needs. We divided our sample into three groups. Um, and, and you can see, if you start from here, the groups with very, very severe and profound intellectual disability, their level of engagement and their quality of life outcomes are significantly less than those for people with milder intellectual disabilities. You may not expect people with severe intellectual disability to be engaged for as long as people with milder intellectual disability, but you actually, you would expect them to be engaged for quite a high proportion of their day. And this just illustrates, on average in our sample, people were disengaged for 38% of the time. That equates to 23 minutes in every hour. The people with more severe and profound disabilities were disengaged for 49% of their time, and the people with milder intellectual disabilities for 29% of their time. So there's this significant difference, which means we have to pay more attention to the quality of support that people with more severe disabilities are getting. But it also illustrates again that the model itself has to be supplemented by really quality support. The next set of factors that I want to talk about are the difference that the support makes. The staff and the frontline managerial working practices, which is the quality of support, that makes the difference. And we know from a significant body of research that those things should have these characteristics. They should reflect the use of active support, and I'll talk about what that is. They should have reflect that every support worker gets good, strong frontline practice leadership as part of their everyday work, and that the support that's provided is compensating and taking note of the difference of each individual that's living in a house. This just illustrates in a very simple way that the people who have higher levels of active support have higher levels of engagement. There's no doubt that there's a correlation and there's a very strong association. If you have good active support in, in a house, in an individual living situation, then people will be more engaged. And if you also have good active support, people will exercise more choice, will, will develop greater skills and will have less challenging behaviour. Active support is the foundation on which more specialist support needs to build. If you have good active support, you sometimes actually don't need greater specialist support. So active support is a way of providing just the right amount of assistance to enable a person with intellectual disability to successfully take part in meaningful activities and social relationships. It's a way of working that can be applied at all times with all people. 
It's not something that you schedule at particular times or with particular people or when extra staff are on or when there's one-to-one -one staff on. It's something that you would expect all of the staff to be doing all of the time with the people that they're supporting. And it's that support that makes the difference to whether people are engaged or not. People with more severe and profound disabilities need support to be engaged. They need queuing, they need different levels of support in order to be engaged, because they find it very hard to do that on their own. So I just want to, if this clip works, give you a sense of what that looks like. There's your iPhone. There's your headphones. Are you going to go and listen to it in the lounge room? Oh, you want to wear that skirt tonight? Okay, would you like to pull it out of the drawer? Ready? We're going to go and start burner. Yeah. Come have a look. So you can choose what you like. Would you like to get this one? Okay. Got pieces of banana? Cut it, stretch it in hand. Once we got there, then we'll get any of the dishes together. Here you go. Be your turn. It's Rachel's turn. Watch, watch, watch. Good job. She made it spin, she made it spin. Hello, Jerry! You want up to the tent? Yes. Hello. There you go, Jerry. Do you want to go this way? Beautiful job, thank you. Alright, let's go. You hold it in there and I'll pull it. How's that? Oh, look, nice work, Dad. Do you feel like a latte? Or a flat white? Cappuccino. So, what do you see if active support is happening? You need to see it, you can't be told about it, um, and as people that are choosing services, you need to go and have a look at what's happening. You see people being supported to be engaged in meaningful activities and relationships, doing something meaningful with, with materials, uh, interacting with other people or taking part in group activities. And you see staff actively supporting people to be engaged, not doing things for people, but doing things with people and providing just the amount of support that they need in order to successfully carry through tasks. And active support isn't something you do just in the house, it's something you can support people to do out in the community as well. So active support is part of, um, people often say, oh, we do person-centred planning in our service, so that's okay. But active support is, is the action that's associated with person-centred planning. Person-centred planning gives a big picture around what somebody's goals and sense of what their interests are, and then active support is the thing that turns that into the reality on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is the only person-centred practice that has a significant amount of evidence. But we also know that in order to embed active support in services, you need to have strong line, frontline practice leadership. Staff need to have support from a skilled practitioner whose role it is to provide observation of their, of their practice, to give them feedback, to model and to coach their practice on a regular basis, to support them to work out what they're going to do on the shift, um, to provide one-to-one -one supervision and to help them to work as a member of a team. Most people with intellectual disabilities have multiple staff that provide support for them and the role of the practice leader is to ensure consistency of the type of support uh, that, that they're delivering to one person. I heard somebody speak the other day uh, who's been part of our study explaining how there were 12 staff involved in supporting one person over a couple of weeks to clean their teeth. And there were 12 different ways in which that person was supported to clean their teeth. Going from, here's the toothbrush, you know, do it, to somebody standing holding their jaw open and doing it for them. So team meetings and working as a team is critical. And the other job of a practice leader is to focus staff on their core business, which is on quality of life outcomes all the time, rather than on paperwork. The other set of frontline 
practice things that need to happen is that, that, the, that the practice of staff compensates for individual differences. We hear a lot about individualisation. Um, you need to adapt the support that you're doing uh, to each individual and to the environment in which they're working in. It needs to be based on the knowledge of the individual. Staff need to know who people are. But they also know, need to know knowledge of the group of people that that person belongs to. Because depending on your age, the syndrome that you might have, whether you've got autism, the type of communication that you have, all of those things, there's a set of knowledge and skills that underpin them that can help to inform individual staff practice. The next element that's critical in delivering good staff practice is staff culture. You hear a lot about culture and we've spent quite a lot of time trying to unpack and look at what culture actually looks like in supported accommodation services. And we now know that there's a fundamental difference between the culture that happens in really poor underperforming houses and the culture in better group homes. And we've characterised that as belonging to a number of dimensions. So in better group homes, you find that the people that hold the power um, align, their values align with the values and the mission of the organisation that they work for. That they regard the residents, the people that they're supporting, as being individual people as part of the diverse humanity in which we're all part of. They recognise individual differences and they take account of those, but they also see people as part of the bigger humanity. Whereas in poorer group homes, you have a sense of othering, that people are regarded as different, not as people. That there's a purpose in better group homes, that the purpose is making life for each person the life that they want, rather than just doing things for people, which is what you find in poorer group homes. Working practices in better group homes are person-centred, not staff-centred, and in better group homes, there's an orientation to new ideas and there's a welcoming of outsiders. Beware of group homes where there are no outsiders coming in or family members or other outsiders aren't made welcome. We did a lot of qualitative work about culture and one of my PhD students who finished last year turned that qualitative work into a, into a scale of culture, which makes it much easier to measure. So we now have a way of measuring culture in group homes. It's got seven dimensions and it's a survey that can be filled in by the team of staff um, and it gives you a sense of what that culture is in the house. It also gives you a sense of the differences that exist in culture, in group homes, even within the same organisation. So this is just plotted, um, there's 11 organisations, and it's plotted that first dimension around the alignment of values. And you can see that, you know, most of the houses are sort of clustered at the top, but there's a few outliers. Those are the ones that need attention. And so this gives you a sense of, uh, we can do a diagnostic of what the culture looks like and start to pay attention to the ones that are the difference. So finally, the things that are the next level of importance are the organisational characteristics. These are the things that are harder to see, but the things that you can inquire about and interrogate an organisation about. This is the characteristics that a good organisation that is able to support good practice should have. They should have training for all their staff in active support. So all of their staff should be trained as they come through the door. Um, they should have uh, frontline staff who have a positive perception of management, that there's a sense of congruity between the frontline staff and the management. That they have senior managers who share a prioritisation of practice and they support frontline practice leadership. Now that might sound obvious, but actually in our study we found quite a lot of organisations where the senior managers didn't really understand practice at all and weren't concerned with practice. They thought, well, that's what they do at the front line. I'm more concerned with the financial stability of my organisation. I'll just show you we, the interviews that we did where the, in the organisations that were really doing really good support um, the senior managers said things like, the practice is really, really important. And they saw frontline practice as being really 
central to achieving their aims. They understood what active support was, they could reinforce it when they went around their services, so they were giving messages to staff about what was important. And they invested resources in a whole organisational approach to implementing good practice. And interestingly, they were, they were continuously reflecting and trying to find strategies for improvement. They weren't satisfied. They were never satisfied with the quality of what they were doing. They always thought they could do better. The other part, the other, the other important thing was that they strongly supported practice leadership, frontline practice leadership, which I talked about. They understood the importance of that. And practice leadership was organised so that it was close to the front line, so that there was a practice leader maybe across two services, but no more than two services. Because if you've got one practice leader who's trying to provide practice leadership to three or four or five different services, that could be up to 50 staff and 50 people with intellectual disabilities. And they can't possibly know each person and know each staff member to provide good monitoring and feedback of people's quality of practice. So having the organisation of practice leadership close to the front line so that you've got multiple front line practice leaders in, a service, in an organisation rather than just one um, is really fundamentally important. So what we did, we did a huge sort of uh, statistical analysis with all of our data and put all the factors in that we'd collected data on that people have assumed are important in getting good practice outcomes for people. One of, the, one of the things that you will see is the audits and the people that regulate services spend a lot of time looking at paperwork, looking at processes, looking at structures. We did that too and we found they didn't have any impact whatsoever on the quality of practice at the front line. What we did see was that was important was the leadership of the organisation and the way in which they valued practice, the design of the group home, and the staff being trained in active support and having good frontline practice leadership. So if you're going to look at a service, those are the things that you should be looking for to see if they exist. And importantly, good practice and good outcomes are really fragile. So this just gives you a visual representation of the organisations who've been part of our study. So green means that more than 67% of the services, individual group homes, in their organisation were delivering good support. The yellow, the, the blue is between 50 and 60% and the red is less than 50%. These were organisations that had paid to be part of our study, that were committed to good practice. And yet still, you can see enormous variability year on year, indicating that once you get there, you have to keep focusing on good practice. So if somebody says to you, oh, this was a group home because we went to see it five years ago, it may not be a good group home today. Things may have changed. And something happened in 2016, which we suspect was sort of the roller of the NDIS, and everybody took their eye off the significance of practice. So just to finish off, you can use um, the knowledge that we've gained from research about housing and support in many different ways. For families, it can help you to think about what to see and what to look for when you're making choices about services with about the person that's in your, your family member that you're making choices with. It can help you know what to look for when you go and look at a service. It can help you know what to ask about when you speak to senior managers. Um, and it, can, it enables you to, to check the claims that an organisation might be making on their website. Have they got independent evidence of the quality of their support? For service organisations, the work that we've done provides some blueprints for good service design, what they should be doing to implement good services. For people like the NDIA, it provides information about what should be included in funding provisions for housing and support. And undoubtedly, that's about staff training for staff to deliver good active support and for strong practice leadership to support those staff in doing that all day, every day. And for the regulators like the NDIS Safeguarding Commission, it's what they should be looking for and what they should be checking up on when they're monitoring the quality of services. And that's not paperwork. They should be spending time observing what the staff are doing 
on a day-by-day -day basis. That's the only way you can know the quality of, the, of life that people are living in any form of housing and support if you spend time looking at that everyday practice because that's what makes the difference to people's quality of life. So there's lots of materials that I'm happy to share. Um, th there's links to the training materials that we've developed around active support and a number of tools um, around what to, what to uh, ask about and what to look for when you go and look at a group home and other forms of accommodation. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much. Now, folks, does anybody have any questions that are burning a hole for you? <laughs> Louise, somebody's coming down? Hi, Louise Bannister from Disability Reference to Public Home today. Admiral with Disabilities ACT. Um, we hear lots of stories about uh, a shortage of support, of support workers, just sheer volume of workers available. Um, and because of that, um, there's also a high turnover of staff. People, when people do find people, there's a high turnover of staff for various reasons. And for that, we often hear stories that the people are time poor. So support workers are time poor. So to actually provide the active supports you're talking about um, often gets lost in the actual um, delivery because they're trying to get through their work as quickly as possible so they can get on to the next client. Mm -hmm. So have you got a solution for that? Yes. <laughs> Organisations where they do good active support keep staff for longer. It's much more satisfying for staff to provide good support than it is to provide poor support. The people I'm talking about are people with primarily intellectual disabilities, so it's not provision of attendant care. And it's central to the culture of any services. What is the purpose of why the staff are there? They're there in order to support the people that they're supporting to be engaged in meaningful activities and, and build social relationships. They're not there to do the housework and to just get things done so they can sit down and have a rest, which is what we saw in some of the really poor houses. So it's, it's creating that culture in an organisation that says you're coming here and this is what we expect of you. So if you, if you see organisations where, you know, where staff are just treating people like objects, to be worked around, to have the house cleaned and just to be kept neat and tidy, that's not good support. And the answer is that we need to set some really clear benchmarks about the type of training that we expect from staff. And organisations need to say, we're only going to employ staff that meet those expectations and have those skills. Thanks, Chris. That's quite the challenge. But I think Canberra's big enough for it. John Mangos here, Happy Fair in Australia. Um, I, I have a bit of an issue with the maximum of six person houses. Um, our experience in the ACT with two disability houses, one with 10 mild to moderately disabled adults, and the other one 10 bed sitters, but not fully yet disabled residents. Um, the oldest house curtain's been going for 13 years. It's been a very happy, active house for the residents. We've had a turnover of four residents in 13 years, which we regard as excellent. There was certainly a perception, I believe, in ACT disability some years back that anything over six was not a good idea. I, I think we would welcome a visit. You, if you one of your trips to Canberra, visiting the house and actually seeing how good a 10-person house can be because there are economics associated with the issue as well as active and quality care and support. I don't doubt there's economics. However, I think the issue is there's individual, there's always individual experiences that are outside of the norm. But you can't question the amount of research that's been done both in Australia and overseas that suggests that six is the maximum number that you should have living together. We could happily come and do the sort of observations that we do of the quality of support and the quality of life of people uh, that are living in a 10 bed house, but we've got nothing to compare it with unless they have the opportunity to live in a smaller house and you might find that they might actually live a, a better life or a worse life, we don't know. 
but you have to you have to take a benchmark at some point and say this is what the research evidence says there's always there's always the things that fall outside the average so you know that's my answer to that um, there's yeah thank you John thanks Chris I think Jennifer's got a question up the back Hi, Jennifer from the Summer Foundation. Um, we are, I've, I've got a pitch later, but we're not in the business of group homes, so um, that's why I've got some questions around. Uh, people have not been given a choice before because they haven't been anything other than a nursing home or group homes. So obviously we're coming from the angle of we want choice and control and we're building dwellings that aren't group homes. But I'm just curious um, about one of the slides that was just before with all the different coloured sections and all the percentages. Um, how did you gather that data? Because I know a number of my applicants are very fearful of speaking um, about their experiences in group homes and nursing homes. Um, and especially if you are dealing with people with an intellectual disability, how was that data collected? Okay, I... <laughs> I'm not an advocate for group homes. What I'm doing is reporting the research that we have about group homes compared to supported living. And at the moment, there is much, much more research about what makes a, a good group home than there is about some of the individual options. So I'm not promoting group homes no, in any way, shape or form. But what I'm saying is that it is possible to have a good life in group homes if you have really good support that goes with that group home. This data was collected through observation. Many of the people that live in group homes have severe and profound intellectual disabilities. You cannot talk to them. You cannot ask them about the quality of their support. We spent two hours in every house of every year looking, using a, a, a tool that's been used extensively both here and in the UK to judge, the, to look at every minute the level of engagement that was happening for the person who was being supported. So it's very robust data, and it's published um, in very high quality peer reviewed journals. So it's not reliant on second hand information, either from family members or from staff. We know that staff always overestimate the quality of what they're doing. And often family members aren't there all the time to see some of the things that are happening. So we use observational data, which I would argue is the best type of data for getting uh, a sense of the quality of what's happening for people with more severe and profound intellectual disabilities. Thank, thank you, Chris. Siobhan, uh, Maria? That was really interesting, what you just said about being observed. I was interested in knowing how you collected the data. How does the study...